Hello and welcome to our webinar, 10 Key Ways to Organize Your Practice for Maximum Profitability, hosted by Power to Practice with very special guest, Dr. Mark Tager. For those joining us that are not yet familiar, Power to Practice is a specialized EMR and practice management platform designed for functional and integrative medicine practitioners. We help practices around the country improve their business, simplify care, and increase patient satisfaction. After the webinar, please check your inbox. You'll be receiving an email invitation to schedule a quick online demo with a Power to Practice software specialist who can answer all your specific questions about our system. Now on to today's presentation. This afternoon's speaker, Dr. Mark Tager, is CEO of ChangeWell, a San Diego-based training company that helps practitioners enhance their presence in person, on camera, and online. A prolific communicator, he has given more than 1,000 presentations written 10 books, and created over 100 video training programs. When not coaching practitioners to go from good to great, he helps health-related companies improve their messaging to doctors. He graduated from Duke Medical School and trained in family practice at OHSU School of Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Tager serves as Director of Practice Enhancement for the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Now, please welcome Dr. Tager. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Great. Well, we all want the same things in our practice. We want to be uh, effective in providing products and services to our clients. And we also want to be efficient. And if you look at efficiency, we've got this delicate balance between standardization and personalization. And this process of balancing those two are really what we're going to talk about today. Uh, a lot of what I'll be drawing on is uh, my latest book on cash pay healthcare, how to start, grow, and perfect your business, along with Stuart Gandalf. What we try to do there is to look at the major questions that we're being asked as we train and teach around the country. What kind of practice is right for me? What should I charge? How do I add products and services? Where do I start? And then how do I grow my practice? How do I create the ultimate patient experience and get patients from the internet? How do I make social media work? How do I get noticed, known, and remembered? And today we're gonna to really focus on chapter seven and each one of you will be sent the PDF from this chapter of the book. And it's on how to create the ultimate patient experience. But I, before I move on terribly far, I, I wanna mention that you know this field of practice enhancement, practice management is, is an ongoing evolving field. And we are always learning and growing from the folks who are doing a lot of the great work. And I'm deeply indebted to four of my co-authors who have taught and trained and shared their ideas with me. Stuart Gandalf from Healthcare Success, a, a great medical marketing uh, company. Uh, my co-partner in the uh, training company where we teach uh, practitioners to enhance their presence. Dr. Mimi Guarneri, who I worked with her really on creating a, a, a structure to help doctors, mainly practitioners, heal themselves. There's a lot of wounded healers around. And finally, Dr. Stephen Mulholland, where we kind of came out with one of the first Bibles way a long time ago on the art of aesthetic practice. And I'm gonna turn now to one of the models that we developed in that book. It's called the Conversion Cascade. And it is a way to conceptualize the patient journey. It begins with six steps, six links in a chain of success that begins with awareness. This is really how good your brand strength is, how good your internal and external marketing is. We move on to the phone and your ability to convert those folks calling into your practice into a visit where you pay exquisite attention to details and you do a great consult, which provides good outcomes and road mapping. And as you work through your treatment protocols, getting that patient adherence. From there, we move on to maintenance, perhaps upselling to better results or other treatments. We want to expose our patients to new products and services through cross-marketing. And we want to ask for ambassadors. We want referrals and loyalty programs in place. And then all of that now is funneling back into social media where awareness is, is growing even greater. But what's the problem? If you, that sounds great, doesn't it? We've got these great six steps. The challenge is that there are leaks and this is what really ruins the, the process and ruins the, both the effectiveness and the efficiency in, pro, in, 
and what you do. In indistinct branding, an unclear value proposition really muddies the water of awareness. The leaky phone, we'll speak to that in just a moment. The callous consult, inefficient practice management, the lack of selling skills for all the key, key staff, fear of asking for a referral, and then not having a, a well-defined social media strategy in place. So this is the existential question, who are you? And we can apply it not just individually, but let's apply it to your practice as well. Because really the first of our 10 steps is that you've got to build a compelling brand. So since day one, uh, people have looked out at their herd of cow, cows and said, well, which ones are mine? And more specifically, which ones are the ones that are belonging to the RR, double R uh, branch. So we came up with this concept of branding cattle. And today, now even all cattle have little tags on their ears to identify who they are. And the purpose of branding is really two goals to it. The first is to differentiate your product and service from everyone else. And the second really is to attract customers and money. So what is branding? Well, it is everything you do or don't do to cause your product or your service to stand out and attract customers and money. The purpose of branding really, if you think about it, is to transform the generic into something that is specific. So let's look at oats. One of these sells at retail for five times more than the other. They're the same oats for the most part. Well, there's at $1.42 a pound, you can buy a bag of oats. It's quantity, it's cheap, it comes in a paper bag. You can move up a little bit and get something that is branded more heavily. It is familiar, it is fast, it comes in a nice cardboard can and it's $3.04 a pound. Or you can go all the way for Irish, acclaimed, unique, beautiful gold colored can and it's six eighty eight per pound. They're all oats. Theodore Levin years ago came up with a, a, a book called The Marketing Imagination and he said that all goods and services can be differentiated and usually are. So he had a total product concept that's worth holding on to and that there's a generic service. There is an expected service. There's a level of service that is augmented. And finally, there's the potential service, what you could actually aspire to have happen. So if you think about a medical practice, well, you know, a generic a license to practice, well, that's a table stakes. That's the ante to get into the game. They expect that you're going to keep some kind of records. But an augmented and potential activities are extra value that the customer does not expect and in potential, everything the service could become. So you might ask yourself, are you different? Does your practice meet the minimum customer expectations with respect to the generic and the expected? Well, yes, if that's true, well, you're probably not too different. If it's no, then you better have some remedial efforts in place. If you're not sure, then you want to benchmark your competition. So if you do a differenti differentiation analysis, look at the deficiencies. You know, where do we need to catch up with our competition? Parity, well, where are we kind of equal? And what are the opportunities where we can move ahead? So the ways you become different is to identify the intangibles that patients value, find ways to make them tangible, turn these intangibles into service deliverables and turn intangibles into products. In short, you really want to delight your patients. So who are you? The next step in this 10 part step is really once you get a sense for that to make sure that each team member knows what sets your practice apart and they should be able to deliver that in a 30 second spiel. We ask the question, is your presence in person on, and online attracting the types of patients that you want to treat? We do the elevator exercise, which is a great exercise to do. You turn to someone in your practice and you say, hey, tell me what makes the practice unique and see if they can get that across in 30 seconds. 
Let's now look to the, the next break in the conversion cascade and we call that the, the leaky phone. So you've got to fix the leaky phone in order to have any chance of success. There she is. She is your millennial. She's the youngest person in the practice, the lowest paid. She's had the least job training. And your future, your finances, your revenue depend on her. My colleague Stuart Gandalf from Healthcare Success has audited thousands of practices and calls. And what he's found that if you audit the calls, here's what you find. The vast, overwhelming, in fact, almost all of them fail to gather information. More than 80% fail to offer an appointment. More than 80% fail to take control of the conversation. Or half of them pro provide too much information or they don't do an effective greeting. And call monitoring reveals that there's long holes, that callers get forgotten, there's busy signals, there's no answers, that people are polite but confused, they're rude, they're harried, or they make diagnoses over the phone. Remember, patients are always, always judging you. And this is an expensive mistake if you don't fix the leaky, the leaky uh, phone. Because if you're practice, and let's say you spend $50,000 on marketing, you know, it's five, $6,000 a month, and you generate 300 inquiries, but you mishandle half of them, you could say that you've, the front desk lost you $25,000. But if that average case is worth $2,000, then the opportunity cost is much, much higher, $300,000. So, Here's why your staff struggles. They try to educate patients over the phone. They have complicated insurance and pricing questions. They ask too many, I have too many competing tasks, no accountability. They don't have the training. They have the wrong people on the phone. So how do you fix it? One, you have to recognize that that new patient call must always be a priority. Set the staff up to succeed. Ideally, if you can, get the call off the front desk. You know, we actually have practices where they sell a very high ticket set of integrative services where they move that call right to the physician who spends 10, 15 minutes educating that person on the products and services that they can provide. You really want your best phone person on the phone. You need to hire right, pay right, train well. You should have call outlines and scripts. And the other thing that um, I think is really important is that the person on the phone has to affirm the clinicians. Wow, you're really going to love Dr. Smith. He's worked with so many people with your, with your issue, and he's helped so many people. You know, he, people come from all over the country to see him. So the call outline must be the perfect greeting. Even when you're harried, another two seconds to welcome them, greet them with the time of day, state your name, ask how you can be of service. Discover the need, establish value, provide a dual alternative close. We have time Tuesday, we have time Thursday, and answer any objections. This next issue, um, this next little bit of technique, comes from my observation that I can pretty well tell how healthy a practice is the first two minutes I'm in the office because I've been in offices where the staff have no neck. <laughs> what do I mean by that? You know, there's something called a bracing, which you brace for an attack. It's the old fight or flight mechanism when you bring your shoulders up to your ears to protect your neck, which is a, you know, very vulnerable part of the anatomy. And that's sort of how wild animals kind of kill you. They grab you by your neck and shake you till you're dead. And it's called bracing. And it is a phenomenon you will see in practices that do not have an affirming culture. And one of the luxuries we have, the 47% of practitioners who are independent and not employees, really have an opportunity to create an affirming practice culture. And what that means is a focus on gratitude and appreciation, you know, catching people doing something right letting them know you appreciate their contribution to everything you're doing. I think you also want to spend some time to understand people's motivations because they're not all the same. I mean, I, you can look at millennials today and a little bit more money 
yeah, maybe a lot less important to them than more time off or even time with you to learn to grow. I think you also want to get in the habit of providing timely, specific feedback, specific feedback uh, to help them grow and change, more positive than negative, and it should be immediate. Let's look at the next break in the conversion cascade. That has to do with something I call the callous consult. You really have to be at your best in the consult. So let's look at what that means. The first thing is you want to drop the gun. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, we are so tempted to quote unquote should on our patients. You should, you must, you have to. And, you know, we, we have a pill for every ill in the conventional world. Well, we don't want to have a supplement for every symptom in the integrative world. We want to be able to tease out patients' motivations and be their coach and their guide in this process, as opposed to being so directive. And if you think about it, there are three aspects, three tools that we have. The first is our gift of time. The second is our gift of empathy. And the third is the process of inquiry that we use, which is so critical. You know, <laughs> there was a classic 1984 study that showed that in, among the family practice residents, the patients were interrupted um, within 18 seconds and only 2% were allowed to, to finish their story. Well, they revisited this in 2007 and I, I want you to know we've made a big improvement. We're up to 23 seconds before we interrupt people. So it, it's, it's sad because in the conventional allopathic world, for the most part, you only get one chief complaint. You only, you know, you can only talk about your headache or your stomach ache or your rash, but you can't talk about all three of them. So we have the luxury in integrative health to look across the silos in medicine. And I, I want to just share with you a little study that was done around irritable bowel syndrome really put forth what I, I think is ideal communication and something that the <clears throat> practitioner should, should hold on to. First is a, a warm, friendly manner. The next is active listening. You want to repeat the patient's words and ask for clarifications. Empathy. I understand how difficult this must be for you. You want to always communicate confidence and a positive expectation. You know, I've had a lot of positive experience treating this, and I look forward to demonstrating that my methodology, what we're going to do here, how we're going to heal your leaky gut, is a, is a valuable treatment. And I think my favorite one is this 20 seconds of thoughtful silence while feeling the pulse or pondering the treatment plan. Along with Robert Hughes, we do a lot of training and enhance your presence. But it really starts there. Your presence is at its greatest in the treatment room, in the consult room, where you are right there close to the patient. And so often, you know, we just, patients go through healthcare and they don't even get touched. They don't even get, in, get examined. So feeling the pulse or being thoughtful and being in that quiet space is a great thing to do. So let's look at the next break in the conversion cascade. And that has to do with inefficient, inefficient patient management. And you know, this is why we've been so impressed with the, the products and services from Power to Practice, because you get to power your practice to bring technological efficiency to bear. And that's so important as we look at this dual process of standardization and personalization. So the EMR, it brings efficiencies and effectiveness. So we have to provide exceptional care, but we also have to grow our profits. And you have to use technology, I think, that is really fitted for the integrative model. I just don't think that the conventional care model works as well. So if we go back to Levitt's model, we look at the fact that what we want to do, if we want to delight our patients, we've got to have both generic and expected service, but all of these augmented services that where you've got all the capabilities you expect, plus the specialized or augmented features to run your practice. Let's look at a few of them. So you want to practice your way. 
And the great thing is you can rely on these easy to use modules. They've got lab integrations with the, you know, the, the best companies, Genova, Quest, ZRT, Spectracell, LabCorp, Precision Analytical. And then there are protocols that make things a little bit easy. That's again, remember standardization. So we've got IV therapy charting and protocols from noted practitioners. So you can do side-by-side -side image charting. And the big thing I think uh, that I, is, is really a, both a, a financial gain and an efficiency gain is the nutraceutical virtual dispensary. And, and this is really interesting. It's powered by Fullscript, but it's directly integrated into power to practice. So that 80% of the, of, that of the scripts that you write for nutraceuticals actually will be fulfilled through this system. So that's a very high percentage. The average number of refills is seven. Average order size is $110. They have more than 27,000 products um, in, their, in their queue. You wanna maximize your time and delight that patient. So there's some great features here. The ability to customize the front office. You've got integrated billing and affordable credit card processing. The automated reminders and alerts the inventory management, and the one-click back patient product progress. But I, I'm all about the delight. And uh, so this is where the patient portal, having a robust patient, patient portal is so great, where you can have this, these specific health questionnaires where patients can schedule online. There's forms and e-signed documents. You can message them. And there's essentially mobile-friendly technology. Okay, moving on. Breaks in the conversion cascade. The lack of selling skills. Oh, we get asked this over and over again. So let, let's hammer this through a little bit. You've got to train your staff to sell well. Well, <laughs> what's the problem? Fill this out for me, everybody. One word. Selling is, okay, where are you on the spectrum? Is it negative? Selling is distasteful. Selling is dishonest. Selling is manipulative. It's dominating the patient. It's, hey, I don't want to be a used car salesman. I didn't participate in healthcare to be a used car salesman. You know, I'm not good at it. Or how many of you thought it might be positive? It's essential to life, influencing others, getting your point across, helping others, supporting others, serving others. It's possible to be professional. And there are some people that quote unquote, well, maybe they have a natural ability. Selling really, when you think about it, is an exchange of value. Your patient wants a result. You know what? She's gonna be willing to pay for the chance to achieve it. And your job is to help your patient get what she wants. You wanna facilitate a win-win value exchange. So there are four simple kind of questions you might just begin with. What outcome or result does the patient want? Is this realistic? Do we offer something that can provide that? Is it appropriate for this patient? Can I frame an offer to provide this product or service in a way that serves this patient's best interests? Solutions. What problems or objections do they have? What's standing in the way? How can I help this patient remove those objections so they can get what they want? Now, what selling really is, again, is helping them get what they want. To do this, you have to build trust. And there's four kinds of ways that trust can be built. It can, the, your products and services can be prescribed. They can be part of a treatment plan. They can be recommended, in which case the product should be included. They can be requested, asked for by the patient, or they can be offered, made available by the practice. Now, Robert and I always, everyone writes this one, this one down because these are five things to never do when selling, and we see this time and time again. First one is to never think of selling as a contest between you and the patient. Never present a product or service by features alone. I'm gonna come back to this. You must connect features to patient benefits. Never, and I'll come back to this one too, it's so important. Never make decisions with your patient's wallet. Don't ever think, I know they can't afford this. You don't know, and you don't know what's valuable to them. Never assume you know what they need, ask. And finally, never forget, your job is to facilitate a value exchange 
in which you help them get what they want. So it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. There it is. It's money. And the wild thing about money is that everything we think and feel about money has been learned. And there are taboos around discussing politics, certainly in these days, religion, sex, and money. You just don't go up to somebody at a cocktail party and say, well, you're an interesting person. How much money do you make? So these taboos make this money discussion kind of mysterious and bad and kind of have these lingering flavors that influence us. So I, I think the first thing you want to do, and everyone in the practice should do, and this is a great thing to do on a Monday uh, or Friday at a staff meeting, just to kick this around. What does money mean for you? So we often ask, what is your earliest memory of money? What messages, ideas, and attitudes about money were conveyed to you by parents, peers, and others in your community? And then, really importantly, how have these attitudes and messages affected your decisions about the money exchange with your patients? Now, if you do this exercise, some amazing stuff comes up, but you will see that these memories, these these early imprinting affects how we have that discussion, how comfortable we feel with that discussion with our patients, your perception of money. So what's your comfort level? How good do you feel about recommending products or services that you may consider expensive? <laughs> Remember, you never make decisions with your patients' wallets. You don't know what priority they have, what values they have. How comfortable are you about making recommendations that won't meet patient expectations? And this is where you do draw the line because there is a, you have to be ethical and honest. And you really need to know your product. You need to work honestly and with integrity, strive to make a match. Now, if for those of you who like tattoos, uh, if you live in Portland, Oregon, where I spent many, many years, uh, this is not a bad thing to tattoo someplace where you could see it or at least have a little card or write it on your the back of your hand. These four are magic phrases. These connect features to benefits so that you can, in order to, which lets you, that's important because. So if you were to just take out the professional supplements and you were asked the question, why can't I get these supplements at CVS or Walmart, we provide these professional supplements to you. And that's important because we know the quality is there. We know that they are not, have not been tampered with. We know the right active ingredients are there. We know that in Dr. Smith's hands, she will know that they will be effective for you. So all of these, these are important phrases and you wanna trot them out whenever you can. Um, and, and to link your products and services from feature to benefit. Um, Stuart, one of my co-authors, throws in some magic questions, and these are some good ones too for sales. What were you hoping that we could do for you? How long have you considered this? What would you like to change? What's most important to you about XYZ? What concerns do you have? Why haven't you done this in the past? If there were one thing that would hold you back, what would it be? So you want to begin, remember we talked about this process of inquiry. This process of inquiry is not just in the consult, it's in all the connections that patients make along their journey in your practice. Now, another thing that I, I think is really important, remember we talked about moving from shooting on patients to being a facilitator and a guide. You also want to establish yourself as a teacher, as an educator, and the best way to do that is to set up your practice as a center of learning. You know, there's this gap. And I used to see this at, at, when I was in, uh, in residency, we would spend a lot of time trying to educate patients about diseases. And uh, when you ask them, oh, an hour later, uh, what they remembered, they said, well, the doctor said I had a disease. It began with a D. I don't know if it was diarrhea, dementia, or diverticulitis, one, it's one of those D diseases. We have to recognize that, you know, even the best of us, the best of us communicators, 
when you're sitting with a patient who is nervous, who's anxious, who, you know, frankly worried about all sorts of things, half to 80% of the information that we provide them is forgotten immediately. And the more sometimes we provide, the less that's correctly recalled. And when patients do remember the information, let's say it was a diarrhea or diverticula, almost half of that is incorrect. So you want to take every opportunity to turn your practice into a learning center. Now, one way of doing that, and this is a lot of the work that Robert and I do in training practitioners to create a signature presentation, um, is public speaking. There was an IFM study that looked at um, those practitioners who valued um, public speaking, those that found it was a very effective patient recruiting method earned $28,000 more each year than their counterparts. And very often, you know, the, the folks who get this really um, very well are in the aesthetic field. Well, they will have in the lobby of their practice, they will have an open house, they'll bring people in, they'll educate them about new products and services. We see this in, in the group visit in which we bring people in under the umbrella of an integrative medicine topic, such as leaky gut, and we bring them in and we educate them and we can also charge for the um, office visit. But I think this is, this is critically important. Um, this is, has to do with presence. And if a prospect, if a group of prospects hear you speak eloquently, you come across as caring and concerned, they will flock to see you. Let's look next at the, another common uh, break in the conversion cascade, and that's the fear of asking for referrals. So you want to standardize the referral and the review process. Now, why don't doctors and nurses and other office professionals ask patients for referrals? Well, you don't understand its value. There's a sort of a fear of, well, looking needy or greedy, fear of being rejected, or they just don't know how. First of all, you want to, anytime anyone asks for referrals, you want to make sure you put that in the patient chart so you, you don't um, bombard the patient. But you want to ask them at the peak of their experience. So anytime a patient spontaneously says to you, wow, you really helped me with XYZ problem, that's when you ask. I'd like to ask you a favor. You know, if you like how we've helped you here, I'd, I'd really love it if you'd send us someone else, some of your friends that we can help in the same way. I'm sure they'd be pleased. We'd like it. And we'll do a great job for them. Or, you know, Mary, we love having you in here. And if you refer some of your friends, we're going to take great care of them. Some, I'm sure you have a lot of nice friends as well. You know, one of my patients asked me recently if we can help her husband with losing weight. And so you get the idea. You want to be able to respond at the peak of their experience, and very nicely ask them. Now, in today's world, we're, we're seeing social media increasingly become important in this, uh, in this word of mouth, word of e-chat referral to build awareness. And you must develop and execute a social media strategy. Now, this is from my colleague, um, Stuart Gandalf at Healthcare Success. They, they help a lot of folks with their, um, with their medical marketing. And he outlined a few steps. One is you've got to have a plan and decide what social media platforms you'll utilize. Now, most docs are using Facebook, but increasingly, uh, Instagram is really beginning to take off as well. How often are you going to post? What kind of content will you post? And then who's going to be responsible or which people? Or, you know, do you incent your office folks? You give them a goal of three a month, four a month, et cetera. But whatever you do, you want to generate a variety of content. So you can post some things from third-party sources, some of that. Pictures from your office. Post about events that you're participating in. Now, I tend to post when I see my friends at conferences. I, I will do that. Office updates, new hours, new services, new doctors, new products, fun things, little quizzes, behind the scenes, some employee stories and patient stories with permission. You want to shake it up. And if you think about it and create this plan, you can generate this variety of content, I think, fairly easily. 
Uh, another thing is to create a calendar. So you want to, in order to generate regular social media, media, media activity, you want to create a calendar for your practice. And you plan about a month ahead. So you shake it up. Maybe there's a little video, then there's a human interest story, then there's a patient profile. Um, in fact, if you can get permission from patients um, to do a little video testimonial, uh, that's among the most powerful things that you can do. If, you've got, if you're going to do that, also make sure you get the, uh, a good release uh, from them. And there are many people that are using social media scheduling programs. Uh, one that uh, Stuart recommends is Sprout Social. Uh, that's a pretty good one for keeping track of all that. And then you'll want at some point to utilize some of the paid social media campaigns. Where These are the ways that you can have posts boosted and sponsored posts. So you really get this wider net to attract new patients. And often this comes down to determining what it is you want to do in-house and where you want to use an agency. Now, you can get agencies who just do social media for you. And, you know, if, the, if you've got questions, uh, I could recommend a few good ones. But the in-house side is, you know, you want to provide the updates on the day-to-day -day organic activities, grab your photos, the photos of the doctors, the staff in action. You want to post when, you know, there's some engaging content. And then you also want to respond to the patient comments. Now, the agency, on the other hand, can share the SEO blog posts. They can update information, but they're really good at also creating and managing this sponsored and boosted content. So you've got a budget. They can help take your assets and move them forward in the best way possible. So that's uh, how you might find that balance. So the conversion cascade, if you think about it, are these six steps. You know, the awareness that comes from your brand in the marketplace, from your internal marketing. And you move people through to make that call where the job of that receptionist is to be so engaging that she sucks that person through the phone lines and into a seat into your reception room where they are excited and ready to see you and you wow them in the consult. You know, you delight them, you wow them, you listen to them. You make the eye contact, you lean forward a little bit. You are at your best in your listening and in your, um, in the therapeutic roadmap that you provide for them. And this allows you to set up a treatment plan and set the expectations with the patient. Really critical the expectation setting in everything you do is critical. And then if you're having a great relationship, they're coming back. Um, they are coming back into your facility where you are doing additional treatments, you're doing maintenance procedures, and you can expose them to other services, cross-market other services. So you're an integrative practice, but you just decided to move into, let's say, aesthetics. You've bought a hydrofacial. You brought an esthetician in. You're bringing in someone, uh, a, a PA or an NP to do injectables. You've just made a skincare line available in your practice to complement your nutraceutical line. So these are the ways you begin to add these other services. And if you've got a folks who are bought into this journey with you, then you're not selling them. You are providing additional value in carefully selected services and products that you're integrating. Ask for word of mouth referral. You know, it's interesting. There are uh, so many practices that just thrive without social media. Um, they do great because they provide a great service. They've got raving fans. They have loyal patients. And you can do it without social media. You just do great care and let people know about it. But increasingly, you want to have this social media presence. It's most important for the, attracting millennials into your practice. You know, the millennial is so different because when they come into your practice, if you've been doing social media, they come in and say, how's Skippy doing? They know Skippy's your dog. Well, it looks like you really had a great time in your vacation in Hawaii. I, I miss Jenny's birthday. It looks like the whole team had a fabulous uh, time. So 
they know more about you when they come in to see you than you ever thought possible. So it's really important to keep that presence. And as part of that, I, I guess I've always had the question of how open do you want to be? How open do you want to make the kimono? You know, in the aesthetic world, you know, it's fun, it's light, it's frivolous, and, and you know, you can post lots of fun stuff. In integrative medicine, where perhaps you're dealing with chronic disease, it's a little bit more subdued in terms of how much you're going to let people know about you personally, but you can find that happy balance. And, you know, that's something that you might work with your social media agency on is getting that, that happy balance as well. So I will be sending to each and every one of you uh, chapter seven from uh, uh, the cash pay healthcare book. Um, it is available on Amazon. It's, it's a big book. It's I mean, this is a, my, uh, my last book with Robert was a nice skinny book. You could read it on an airplane. This is a, a big fat one with checklists and uh, because it takes into account the fact that also we're in different stages. Some people are just starting, contemplating and starting businesses. Others have businesses they want to grow. And then there are those folks that are running great businesses and they want to get nationally known. They want to perfect their business. They want to take it to the next stratospheric level. So we'll be sending that to you as well. Any questions or concerns, you know, there's my email, mtager at changeworld.com. Uh, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn, business to business. You can grab me on Twitter at, at Mark Tager. And I am recently doing a fair amount of Instagram at drmtager. And um, power to practice, um, you will be able to reach them at this 800 number. Uh, they will send you a note about uh, a demo. It's, a, it's a, a wonderful system. And it's so much more than just record keeping. It is a system to, to engage. It is a system to attract. It is a system to educate and a system to wow patients. So, you know, as we've looked, uh, we did a pretty comprehensive survey in the book. Uh, I think in one of those early chapters about EHRs and EMRs and, and, Really, if you're in the integrative space, this is the product for you. So without further ado, let me turn this over back to Kristen. We'll uh, be glad to grab a few of your questions and, um, and answer those as, as you ask them. Thank you so much, Dr. Tager. Uh, as a reminder, if you have a question, uh, feel free to submit that through the Q&A on the control panel. Um, and we'll, I'll give you a minute or so to type those responses up. Okay, what's a good budget for paid social media? Um, great question. So we have seen, you know, this, this depends on the size, scale, and scope of your business. I mean, there are you know, practice, there are million, there are $5 million healthcare businesses to 1 million. Uh, there are practices that are 500,000, but small and boutique and do very, very well. So um, what I, what I recommend here is that you set, you know, most people set about a 10%, eight to 10%, sometimes even up to 12% marketing budget. And you look at your mix, and I think you can do pretty well for maybe two or three percent of that going to the social, maybe four percent into social media. It's not uncommon for a you know modest size integrative medicine practice to spend three to five thousand dollars a month on their social, two thousand dollars a month uh, as well. Uh, so I hope that helps and answers that. Um, do you find it's easier to give a patient specific summary of the visit so that they can recall the information? Absolutely. I think what you want to do is you want to make sure to have printouts. You want to engage them in a patient portal, uh, which is very important where they can learn. Uh, the other thing that I've seen that, that is we really advocate is that if you can get comfortable with video and create some video blogs or some video FAQs, uh, one of the best use of your, of your time is to create a library of video FAQs to which you direct your patient pre and post. Now, we've seen this used very successfully by cash pay surgeons who basically see the patient with a telehealth 
visit first, a free telehealth visit. Maybe they'll send their x-rays over. Uh, and, and this gets to the question that someone asked just a minute, uh, just about telehealth as well. So we'll, we'll see this. They will do a, a telehealth consult. Sometimes it's paid, sometimes it's unpaid. Then they will do the procedure, and then they will send the patient to their video library where they learn what, can expect, what they should expect after surgery, how to take care of their wound, how to be, get up and around, what exercises they can and can't do. And increasingly, again, we talk about this in the, in the book, as you develop a membership model, what you're doing, if you still want to take insurance, Remember, it's illegal to take insurance in one place and not in the other. You can't do that. You can't have your cake and eat it too. But what you can do, or at least for covered services, what you are able to do are set aside non-covered services. For example, uh, a nutrition consult, uh, an M Health. We will review your your mobile health data. You have access to our video library and access to our seminars and webinar, uh, our seminars, our webinars, our, um, uh, uh, the meetings we hold in the practice. So you can come up with a set of non-covered services that really work well in a membership model for which you are contracting. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, how, telehealth, um, telehealth uh, there are so many good telehealth platforms these days. I, I mentioned about five of the, the the, the best ones in the book. Um, some of them have some integrated uh, features for charging patients. Uh, remember, telehealth is still state regulated. So you, if I, my advice is always to check with a healthcare attorney in your state to make sure that you are not crossing the lines. Some states, for example, Florida, you have to, um, have, they have a law that you have to see the patient in your practice. Um, others, it's the Wild West. So this is constantly changing. So um, uh, what I recommend for telehealth, by the way, is a good microphone. Uh, what I'm using my, right now in my, on this session is a Blue Yeti microphone that really captures sound well. I like the Logitech camera. We'll use that. Uh, it's you know $130 or something like that. And it's 18 pixels. It's, it's excellent for... Um, for video, um, so both of those can help um, as well. Next, how do we sell tickets to talks at our practice without coming across cheap? And how much do we charge for tickets? Well, this is interesting because this gets to the membership model. So if you are in our membership model, which is pick, pick a number, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars in which you're paying for access and all these other non-covered services, one of them is you get you exclusively get to come to our um, educational events, and you can bring a friend for free, or you can usually charge any place from if you're just charging for events, you can charge any place from twenty-five to seventy dollars, depending upon the length, what they're getting. If they're getting some supplements, you know, you will get a free bottle of of a supplement and that's a $70 value or a book. Um, so that's how that works. So I, I, the question was, does it come across cheap? No, you want to establish value, but there are some, remember, not all p patients are equal. If you had a patient who referred five people to you, you would go and say, Mrs. Jones, thank you so much. We normally charge $75 for our two hour seminar, please. Be my guest. Um, bring your four friends also, because I know they'd love to hear this talk on leaky gut. Do I recommend phone answering services? <sighs> With reluctance. I mean, the best thing that you can do is is to have a dedicated individual, or to take or to take the call yourself. If you are small and you're in a micro practice, um, you can have a phone answering service, but then it should be, you know what? Dr. Smith will personally get back to you because you in fact are the, the best salesperson for your practice. You know the most, you're the most passionate and you can guide that patient um, to come in and to work with you. 
So I think uh, any other questions, Kristen, that you got? I, these are the ones that I saw that came in. Those are the ones I saw as well. Okay, excellent. Well, on behalf well, again, of... I, go ahead. Yeah, so go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you again for your time and expertise and that we'll send the recording out tomorrow to everyone. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.